Hello and welcome back and I want to take another trip down memory lane. Today I want to talk about more old NAS. Fitting in between other projects when I'm talking about brand new network stat storage and drive and Thunderbolt and all that sort of stuff. Today I want to talk about some old stuff. Just to let you know how these brands have evolved over the years and it's time for Synology once again. Now a number of you know this device existed once. It's one of the things that Synology kind of experimented with for a while and it came to nothing. And I know a number of you know about this device because loads of you bought it when you were sold by its rhetoric, which was for the time in 2012, pretty damn impressive. And over the years, a number of you have kept with this device and then wanted to upgrade it in a number of ways, finding that you just can't because Synology invested in this new kind of tech, invested in a new kind of NAS and experimented and for them, I don't think it paid off enough and they ceased production of it. I'm, of course, talking about the DS213 Air, their first wireless NAS. This was a NAS that had LAN connectivity just like the devices that came before it, but it also arrived with wireless capability. It was a NAS that you could set up and it would communicate with the other devices in your network environment via your router. It would effectively be a wireless NAS. You could even connect directly to it as a wireless AP as well. And it's a feature that's been emulated a number of ways over the years. For a start, even modern NAS right now in 2020 arrived with support of USB wireless dongles. They know there is still a market for people that want to have a network attached storage device that is wireless. And they don't want to use cables connected to a router or a switch. They want the NAS to be in a completely different room to the router or the switch in their home or business environment. The, the need for a wireless NAS has always existed, although it has ebbed and flowed, and particularly with regards to the speed that you get wirelessly, because that was ultimately its downfall, I think, for a number of people out there. Because wireless connectivity has its own network speed limitations, particularly in 2012, but I'll get to that later in the video. Let's talk about this device. Now, it was released in 2012. Uh, it was part of the later releases of 2012 in their 2013 series, the S213 Air being the name. Um, it arrived with a fantastically underwhelming CPU, uh, the Marvell Kirkwood MV6282. And you're right, I did read that off camera because I'm human. Now, that was was a one core CPU as a 1.6 gigahertz processor and it was accompanied with 256 megabytes of memory. So in terms of hardware inside, pretty poor. But again, remember, we are still talking about 2000, 2013 and this wasn't a device that was sold on the back of its power. It was sold on the back of its wireless connectivity and wireless access to your data. Now, the device actually still supports up to DSM-6, it really does. So even with that incredible, me, incredibly mediocre CPU and memory inside, it still supports, you know, relatively a streamlined version of the latest DSM, which is really impressive given this was released in 2012 and it's 2020 in an over eight years of firmware and feature upgrades of DSM, we've seen it get bigger and better and better. So I'll be interested to see in another video just how well DSM actually performs on that hardware. Now, for those of you that have been following Synology NAS for a number of years, this is what Synology NAS packaging actually used to look like. They were really pushing the green angle because their devices were on 24 seven and it was incredibly marketable to promote a device solely based on being energy efficient because even at that point, just like in 2012 today, people were utilizing old servers and just leaving them on for days at a time. And because they aren't designed for that kind of architecture, they use more power, produce more vibrations, and the degradation on the components is significantly higher. So for them, even in 2012, it was worth promoting the idea of it being as efficient as possible in every sense of the word. But with its support of DSM, I believe this arrived with DSM-4, uh, at that point, it might have been five, but I don't think it was. Um, it arrived with support of multiple applications, even at that point, with loads of apps readily available and being highlighted on the box. DSM at that point had become its own gra graphical user interface and being a far more evolved operating system. It wasn't just about having a drive that could be accessed over the network or the internet. You wanted this full, bespoke, configurable, accessible system. So... What do we get inside the box? Well, we have got our UK mains lead. Shockingly, let's get rid of the box there. 
Also, in the accessories box, we have a bag of our setup stuff, and I'll go through that in a moment. We have an external power brick for the device, because even though it has a very modest TPU, being a wireless device, it did need a little bit more oomph under the bonnet there. We've got our external power brick. We've got a Ethernet cable there as well, a Cat5e cable, because the device wasn't just Wi-Fi only, which is handy. On top of that, we have screws for installing our hard drive. I would say hard drives and SSD, but in 2012, the cost of an SSD in SATA, wow. Um, if we carry on moving forward into the bag of accessories, we can see inside we have the CD for our software for installing DSM as well as the client operating uh, the client apps for your PC or Mac system. And again, this supported Mac OS as well at that point, which at the time was kind of a big deal. I've mentioned in another video before. But, you know, uh, in the closing stages of the noughties, we're talking like 2008 to 2010, Mac really, really locked things in on their platform. They were really making everything proprietary. I believe it was after that that we saw things like the Apple Mac Time Capsule and the Mac Drive and basically Mac just saying, no, you're not using anyone's devices but ours. And Synology, you know, managed to circumnavigate that and circumvent those rules with things like support of Apple Time Machine as well as iTunes Server as well. And we've got our quick start installation guide. And again, anyone that saw my video the other day um, regarding one of the earlier Synology devices, the USB station, will know that it came with that really nice manual. Uh, this they kind of moved into that little sheet of paper now, which again, I'll have to move away from the camera light and my rigging there because it's going to go all crazy there. Um, but we've got our warranty information. The device arrived with two years of manufacturer's warranty. So let's face it, let's get to the big guns. You want to see the unit. It's quite interesting that the packaging of Synology units hasn't changed a great deal. Definitely one of those, if it ain't broke, don't fix it um, motifs going forward. If we have a look and get inside the packaging here, we can have a look at the device itself, hopefully. Have a look. Right there. This does not want to make it easy. Um, and there we have the air chassis. Now, I know a number of you looking at this are going, that looks absolutely identical to the modern J series right now. And it's really, really similar, but there are key differences. For a start, this is certainly wider than that of a standard 21, uh, 220J available now. Unfortunately, I don't have one of them here in the studio. I had uh, a 220J on loan and I had to go uh, at the end of last week, which is a shame really, because it would have been good to put them side by side. But it's already worth noting that you've got that ventilated side panel. They were already doing that quite clever branding option there, very early doors, and it was the same on either side, which again, no one else has really emulated that yet in terms of network attached storage, and it's a real shame because it's a smart idea. Um, we've also got active cooling there on the base, and if we look at the front, it looked a little bit more aggressive in terms of its shape. Not only is it wider, but even the LED lights and the way everything's displayed, it seems a lot edgier at that point. They've certainly tweaked the design of uh, this particular chassis over the years. And it's been so subtle with each generation that we've not really noticed it until we see a disparity of eight plus years like we're seeing right now. Now, as you can see from the front, we've got LEDs there that denote the status of the device, the network connectivity, and LEDs for each of the individual drives. We've got a power button there at the bottom, but we don't have a USB port there on the front for quick backup. So again, bit of a shame there at that point. That wasn't really a common feature even at that early doors, but what is interesting is on the rear there because we've got that LAN port there, so we weren't heavily reliant on wireless connectivity if we didn't want it. We've got USB 3, which in 2012 on a NAS, particularly a budget NAS, was a big deal having USB 3 on the NAS back then. And on top of that, you've got um, the wireless button there for deactivating or activating the wireless connection on the device because you needed that wireless connectivity there to have an on-off switch like any Wi-Fi device. Now, if we look inside, it opens just like the same as the rest of the J-series devices. There's the inside there. And we can see that in terms of design, very little has actually changed in this chassis in terms of shape. Obviously, this has moved forward. I'm not 100% certain if this utilizes SATA 3 or if this was a SATA 2 device at that point, which would have made all the difference between 6 gigabits per second and 3 gigabits per second. But 
In terms of chassis design, it's incredibly familiar. And you can see that they, you know, they've really stuck with that design over the years because clearly it works for them. So what could you do with a device like this? Well, obviously you had capabilities such as download station, mail station, um, file station, you had DLNA media server, you had support of printers, you had support of external devices, and DSM was really coming into its own at that point with support and client applications becoming available for PC and Mac systems. There was even the, uh, the rise of Android devices, meaning that the Android apps that you could utilize along with iOS, uh, you know, Mac devices, Apple devices even, um, meant that you could, could communicate with your NAS exceptionally well. But let's focus on why this was popular and why ultimately it failed as well. Wireless connectivity. Now, wireless connectivity with a NAS has huge advantages. Notwithstanding the idea that at that point in 2012, you'd like to be on your wireless device and you wanted to communicate with it. Wireless routers in 2012 were being handed out by internet service providers, and of course you could buy them, but they were nowhere near what they are now. They were nowhere near as smart in terms of MIMO and managing multiple devices, assigning quality of service and more. So having a wireless NAS for the people that wanted to communicate directly with it was advantageous. And on top of that, if you had this device and then you wanted to utilize it wirelessly with your router and then use LAN connection with your router, that was an option too. Maybe you're in office setting or taking, adva taking advantage of surveillance settings, which were in NAS kind of in their infancy at that point, a wireless device had its advantages. However, even in that year, the speed of wireless, particularly from this device, was 300 megabits. That meant 30 megabytes per second. That's quite bad, given that there's a connection on the rear that will give you 100 really, really easily, and at that point was pretty much on every device you owned. So as attractive as the idea of a wireless NAS was, as soon as you used it, you suddenly realized you've got convenience, but you didn't have speed. And just like all things in data, with every passing year, we want faster data, we want bigger data, we want it now. And the wireless connectivity of this was just not up to task. Now, this isn't something that's gone away. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, wireless connectivity on Synology NAS has persisted, persisted, but not in this way. So right now you can use most modern Synologies and connect a USB wireless dongle for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Some of these with dual frequency um, uh, support will allow much, much faster speeds than the 300 allotted by this device and ultimately has made them attractive, whether it's to be used by IP cameras wirelessly or storage and connected users to create a private, a private wireless area network and have the NAS acting as a wireless AP. But ultimately, this is a great experiment from Synology that didn't quite pan out. And it wasn't really Synology's fault. It was wireless connectivity in general and the entire mode of wireless transit data just not living up to wired at that stage. I don't think Synology will ever really go down this road again, although we have seen an evolution of this in other ways. Of course, we're talking about the wireless router series. With the range of router devices coming from Synology over the years, they didn't give up on wireless devices in the end, and they continued moving forward. Hopefully, we'll see a Wi-Fi 6 version of this device here, but I don't think we'll ever see Another wireless NAS from Synology. I fear that has bit the dust. But this has been the DS213 Air from back in 2012. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do stay tuned for more of these kind of look back over our shoulder um, videos on network attached stories as we go forward. And of course, stay tuned for more and more new things in 2020 in the world of data storage. If you enjoyed it, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. And I'll see you next time.